All right, hello everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about grace in the ending. And uh, I think in order to do so, I might step back in time a little bit and talk about the concept of grace. Grace, of course, a theological concept. I'm not a theologian, but I think it's kind of Augustine was the big dude behind this. And the kind of idea was some people have God's favor and some people don't. Those that do are called the elect and those that don't well, they're out of luck. And, um, you know, where it's interesting is when I look back on my own chess career before computers, there was a sense of like when you played someone really strong that they had some kind of gift, that they could see something or be part of something that was spiritual or higher. And now with computers, I find the discussion has moved on to this other uh, dichotomy between uh, those that have some kind of gift, which you could call genetics or whatever you want else might want to call it, or that it's learned. And, and there's, you know, a big fight, kind of a dogmatic fight between the two sides. Um, and as a chess coach, or as a fan, as a player as well, I'm not too interested in the fight of like genetics versus like learned uh, behavior. I'll just say as a fan especially, I've witnessed what I will call grace. And that is, and you get this especially in decisions where somebody's mind kind of pierces through the fuzziness and lack of clarity in the position in a remarkable way. And uh, as a fan, that's just a remarkable thing to perceive. And I think all of us at some level have felt like they had some kind of experience like that on the board as well. And that's one of the things that draws people back into the game again and again. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just take a couple examples to try to kind of flesh out what might be meant by this idea of grace. Okay, so the first one you might have seen before. Uh, I think it is a classic example of how to play the rook ending well. And um, this is Capablanca, Tartakower, back in the day, 1924. And the first time I think anyone sees this position, they're kind of blown away. And let me just show you what uh, Capablanca did. It's white to move. If you want, of course, you can pause and try to think about it yourself. So... Uh, King G3, exclam, and really, when you think about it, it's like, well, if you don't do King G3, <laughs> you're kind of in trouble. What else are you going to do? And the king needs to come up to help shepherd this pawn in, but also maybe to create some threats against the black king. Another feature of the position that's very important is that in general, in the rook ending, connected past pawns are just horrendously valuable. So if we win the pawn on f5, which our king might well do in a lot of variations, then that's a good thing. So let me just, this we could spend honestly the whole lecture on this decision here, but I wanna go through it kind of quickly just to give the sense that, oh right, Capablanca had a sense that this was coming and I'm gonna try to blow your minds a little bit more after we go through a lot of these key moves. We're threatening mate, and we're again threatening mate, and now we have a completely winning ending, mostly because our king is so much better, right? And then, right, the game goes on. And this was a position that was analyzed a lot by Alekhine and uh, Reddy and all these other guys back in the day because it seemed mind-blowing. Um, and I think it's a great example. I think if you wanted to ask, you know, try to teach somebody what rook endgames are, this is a good position to start with because it really emphasizes the power and necessity of coordinating the rook and the king. Uh, and that the king is there to escort, to shepherd the white pawns. And I don't want to go into all the details. I just wanted to share with you that not only did Capablanca play King G3 here, but where it gets even more interesting in my mind is that you go back 
And let's talk about, say, this beautiful move, G5. And it fixes G6 and invites knight E3 to F5. So you ask yourself, well, wait a second. I mean, most players would not allow this. It would just seem like, why are we letting uh, the knight in? And aren't we giving up our beautiful bishop for the knight? All this stuff. And so when you see, think about it, this move g5, you say to yourself, right. Capablanca had seen this move, king g3, coming up. So the, you know, it's hard to visualize the transformation of the position. And then in order to play that move g5, we're playing king g3. You have to see that, and you have to understand that it's winning. And I think Capablanca is the first one where people start talking in odd tones about uh, the guy's ability to uh, really capture uh, the essence of a plan, kind of like without thinking too much about it. You know, I'm sure there's obviously some thought just to come up with that is pretty amazing. But to, you know, have a mind that's able to pierce through, like I said, the uh, a lot of the details. Maybe another key and fun variation is if you go this way, we have to find king h5, so that we're threatening king g6. And if you take, well, now again, the king is going to shepherd the pawn down. Okay, let's move on to a second Capablanca example. This one is also very famous from this precise position. And again, another great example of what the uh, rook and pawn uh, endgame is striving for. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times when you look at rook endgame books or endgame books, they're teaching you algorithms. You know, how to do X, you know, X, Y, and Z in a specific scenario. And that's definitely important. But uh, more interesting to me and actually more practically useful is just the notion that your king and your rook have to be active. And this game, as well as the last one, really emphasized what that principle was all about. So let's imagine, well, let's imagine, let me show you what he did. You can pause it if you want to think about it, of course. And he played, Capablanca played f5. Takes king f4. And look, we're getting our rook in and our king's taking the pawn. And the h pawn is loose. It's actually all over. And our king's coming in. Mm, game over. Now, Again, this position you'll find in a lot of ending books, I think, uh, of F5. And it's a great example, a great pedagogical example of how do you play the, the rook and king ending. But again, like the last example, I kind of want to blow your mind here for a second. And that we can go back. And white has had a nice little edge for most of the game. And all of us, regardless of your level, struggle in positions like this to find uh, plans, you know, to pl find plans that work. And most of us won't be able, against strong opposition, to really break anybody down. But watch what he does. Okay, rook h2. So now we're threatening the e-pawn. Okay, and now there's a question of like, well, what does black do? He can't take the rook on g5. He can't move the queen because of like a rook takes h5, i5 thing. Um, and the um, uh, king, well, we're going to see what's going to happen with the king. Now, maybe black, if he had been savvy, could have thought about rook e8, but there's going to be a long road after that. So what I'm going to try to say is, He's seeing that there's the Zugzwang here that's involving the f5 break. So let's check it out. Snip, can't take with the, the pawn. You got to trade queens. And then there it is. We have our position, right? There it is. There's our position. So again, grace, grace in the ending it makes it look, sound, makes it as if it were easy, you know, to be playing these moves. Okay. Uh, one reason I came up on this 
idea of talking about grace is over at the Chess Dojo, we've been holding a Wednesday book club talking about Gelfand's latest book called uh, Technical Decision Making in Chess. It doesn't sound very sexy, uh, but it is um, been really interesting to see really how you play positions, say, like this. And um, one thing I talked about in our the lecture last week was the idea of inertia in the ending. And one of the features of seeing inertia, we all have inertia in our plans. That is, we have a kind of sense of where things are going, and it's oftentimes hard to pull back from those plans when they're wrong. But it's more possible to see those, as I discussed uh, in last week's lecture, by those I mean plans, more possible to see plans in the ending because it's possible to, more possible to make a whole series of moves, and especially that's the case in pawn endings. Uh, you can in my experience, you will be able to think at the highest level of depth in pawn endings more than any other kind of position in chess in general. You, the more, you can go 10 moves deep, 10, 20 moves deep, and then confound that question, the dumb party question of like, how many moves deep can you think? You know, because usually you can't think hardly any moves deep at all, but in a pawn end game, you can often do so. This pawn end game, I don't think you could uh, do it when you're playing, and Gelfand admits as much. And what's interesting to me about this is he comes to this position and says, A4, I must be winning. Now, I can imagine coming to this position and saying, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm not going to lose and I feel pretty good about it. But to say I'm winning, that's another interesting thing. Because there's so much that can happen between... Uh, this position and, and actually winning the game. Um, so I'm going to show what happened a little bit. I won't go into all the variations, but then I'm going to take you back to where I think the decision was made. And in principle, I think we can say white black has one problem, and that is that our two queenside pawns are holding back these pawns. And yes, black can break with b5, but if he does so, uh, his pawns will be sl split and weak. Okay, so let's look. King c6, king c3. This is, in fact, a high-level GM move. I think a lot of people would be fra afraid of king d5 and might have played king d3 so that they could play e4. But for Gelfand, this is obviously winning. Now, I want to say I, I, I stress that because to me it wasn't necessarily obvious and I had to calculate this whole long variation here where the only really clean variation I came up with was f3, x clam, where if you play f4, then that's going to enable g5 and the race is going to be a little bit tight. But f3, he's going to have to come take this guy and then get in the way of the f pawn and we're going to win the race. So... Uh, again, grace. I was very hard I, for him. I don't. I'm. I'm. I don't, I'm not convinced he even calculated. He just said king d5 e4, and white is winning. Okay, b5. Snip, snip. E4. G5. H5. And now, definitely a mistake by uh, Gelfand, and he played f4, which is kind of insane because it allows this, which. Black didn't play. This is Hare Krishna playing black in 2014. Um, in any case, uh, it's still winning for white, but it, it's going to take a little bit of work. In the game, this was done, and you get to see the point pretty clearly here, where the pawn's going to run, the e pawn's going to run, black has to go back to fetch it, we go and strip up the uh, black pawns. Okay, so... Where it gets interesting, though, get more interesting, let's put it that way, is we go back a little bit, and White's been nursing an advantage uh, for a couple moves now. He's got that extra pawn, and there's all kinds of things he can do, but when he plays queen h5, he sees the end game. He sees a4. So let's take a look. Queen d7, what else are you going to do? 
rookie six. Snip, snip, snip. Now, many people would take on B6 without thinking. Uh, and maybe it's mildly promising to take on B6, but there will be counterplay, right? There will be counterplay here. So instead, King C2, and now there's just this big threat of Rook E7, and if Rook G5, we can jam the Rook with moves like G4 and F4. So then King C7 has to happen, and there's our end game. You know, and so you come, you're, imagine you're over here, and you feel pretty good about this position, and it turns out queen e6 might win more directly, but you know, you want to make it as clean as possible, and you have your reservations about queen e6. So you see the pawn ending here, and you say to yourself, right, a4 is going to win. Not because I've calculated it. I haven't, you know, not sure about the calculation. I just know it's going to win. I, to me, that's a great example of grace. Okay, let me share another example. All right, so this game, I was in St. Louis last year, and this was from the 2019 Senior U.S. Championship with the veterans Alexander Golden against Alex Jermolinski, both Rook and game experts. And uh, Alexander's up a pawn, and they're both Alexanders. Golden's up a pawn, and Yermo just played Rook A2, doing the standard thing, where he's going to get behind the pawn. And, well, the... Um, General rule of thumb that I like is that you can, if you, when you ask yourself, is a position winning, you can say, well, uh, it's winning if there are two weaknesses. And here we can say that black has a weakness and that he's down a pawn. But that in itself isn't, isn't usually the end of the world. We need something else. We need some other weakness. Okay. Now... And, and black doesn't really have another weakness, right? So just by that measure, it, we, what we have here is not enough. Okay. Um, another very basic rook endgame um, rule is that there's three positions of the rook. The best is to be beside, the, behind the pawn. The next, the second best is to be uh, on the side of the pawn. And the third best is to be in front of the pawn. And um, whether and that's whether you are the defender or the attacker. In all those cases, you want to be either be behind, second best on the side, and third best in front. And why don't you want to be in front? Well, one of the key reasons is, let's imagine the rook is on b8, and you start pushing this pawn, you... Um, you lose scope of the rook with every time you push, and then it's going to be really hard to actually move that rook once you get there. So I think uh, a lot of players here would play rook to something like rook c5, rook c7. Now I have to plug in my computer before it dies. <laughs> they play rook c5, rook c7, and you know, you would just have that one advantage. And here Alex thought for a while and played what was in his mind a winning plan. And I got to interview him after the game. And I was amazed at his level of certainty. And it really reminds me of the Gelfand game as well. And he played Rook C8. So... It's anti-intuitive in that, um, you know, the rule of don't put your rook in front of the pass pawn because that's what's going to happen here. All right. So an amazing thing about this intuition is that he's already imagining something and he's saying that it will come to pass. 
Now let me bring up an analysis board and share with you what uh, I'm talking about here. So if we look at this position uh, as a known thing, and you can see that Rook on A8 is terrible. If you like, we can even shift it to B8. Doesn't matter, same thing. And let's start pushing this pawn. My pawns are pretty magical. They can move more than one square. But I'm, white can't do anything else anyway. And we push it to h6. And then you ask yourself, well, how do you make progress here? You can't. There's nothing to do. There's absolutely nothing to do. And, uh, you know, let's say you go harass the, this guy, and then you go, you know, you come here. I'm just going to be able to check you to death. I'm going to check you to death and go back to rook b1, and you got nothing. And the situation would be exactly the same if the pawn were here. Nothing doing. So uh, one time, actually, I was, uh, Yermo was playing uh, black in this game. He made the joke that we could give white all kinds of extra pawns, and it still wouldn't matter. It would still be a draw. Okay. So um, the key idea is that white needs some other pawn. The G pawn isn't going to do it, but the F pawn will. And um, let's say we get here and the king is here. Well, now it's winning because king F7 is rook H8. Let's just show that. Rook H8, excuse me. Rook, <laughs> sometimes. Rook H8, rook H7, rook B7, rook H7. And of course, if he takes on f6, we have rook f8. So let's call that the skeleton of the idea that Golden's going to execute. And let's return there. So what Golden is saying is that he will get a pass pawn that is not a g pawn and not an h pawn, i.e. one of these pawns will make it. And uh, to me, that was real interesting because when I start like thinking about a position like this, I just, I'm like, well, the guy can do all, <laughs> feels like he can do all kinds of things. Um, and um, yeah, but you get inside his mind a little bit and you start saying, okay, I guess I can see it and say it's totally gone. It's absolutely gone here, which is, yeah. A moment of grace and this one definitely comes from you know a knowledge a deep knowledge of that skeleton position and just then thinking about this pawn structure and saying right no way now i think yermo could have made it more difficult for uh golden by not doing e5 because e5 will i think help white make the pass pawn in any case, I did play around with this position quite a bit, and I wasn't able to come to any way for uh, Black to solve it. So let me just share the end of this game. And what is Yermo doing? Yermo is hiding the king with the thought that the, um, the uh, rook won't be able to check him. Kind of like hanging out on g7, but this time he's going to hang out on h5. We just go back. There's no rush. And b7. Rook b4. But now f3. Now f3. And we will get that pawn, that, that pawn, pass pawn. And here it goes. Boom. e4. F2, what is it? I don't know what else he's going to do. He can't take the pawn. And E5 coming up the board is coming fast and furious. Rook B3, King E2, and Yermo resign. So a really delicious game, I felt, and an example of grace. So... I could do many, there's of course many, many more examples, but the thing that I, a couple things I just want to end on here is that there's 
many moments that I guess I would call spiritual when you experience them as a player, where you feel like you've understood something that goes through the madness of chess. And a lot of the times, you know, I think most chess players, speak for myself, when they're playing a position, there's a kind of an opacity to it. You know, we're just happy if we see a little bit of something. There's an opacity and there's very rare moments where you feel like you can see through the position. And that's what I mean by grace. And it's uh, sometimes possible in the middle game, in the opening. But I think especially in the ending, it can be very beautiful and powerful because it will be not just a, a couple moves, it will often be quite a long series of moves that you are going to need to execute to get to your desired end. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this theological discussion. And uh, yeah, we'll be back here on the St. Louis channel real soon. Bye-bye.